Thank you for joining today's webinar, Managing Expenses with Dr. Mark Wright. This webinar is brought to you by Premier Academy 360. Attend webinars like this one or visit the content library and on-demand learning at learnacademy360.com. We want to hear from you and provide content you want. So please stick around after this webinar and answer our survey poll. It's my pleasure now to introduce our spe speaker, Dr. Mark Wright. Dr. Wright has extensive experience in consulting, teaching, lecturing, and he's the CEO of the Practice Management Center and is the professional editor of Review of Optima excuse me, Review of Optometric Business. Over to you, Dr. Wright. Thank you very much. We're in the middle of uh, the worst two weeks of the pandemic. Some places in the country are a week or two ahead and other places are a week or two behind. But in general, within these next two weeks, we're going to see the highest number of deaths in the country due to COVID-19. The good news is that we're approaching the top of the curve and will soon be coming down the other side of the curve toward what we're calling the new normal. And we're going to be discussing what the new normal looks like as we move forward in this webinar series and as we know more about the new normal. But no matter what the new normal looks like, practice management financial rules will still apply. This is the big question that I want you to ask. Is your profit intentional or accidental? Let's start with the end in mind, profit. If your practice is not making a profit, then it's really not a business. It's just a hobby. Profit is a good thing. It allows your practice to provide better care to patients. A profitable practice can be open more hours and more days, have more staff to better serve patients, and have more and higher quality, quality quality equipment to both test and treat patients. Many practices wait until the end of the year, or worse yet, wait until the, the owner is ready to pay their federal taxes to see if they made a profit. In other words, the practice owners are looking at their practice numbers historically. They're looking back to see how they did, rather than keep on top of the numbers in real time, being proactive and driving the numbers. So that real question to ask is, is your profit intentional or accidental? If you wait until the end of the year when you're getting ready to pay your federal income tax to see if you made a profit, then if your profit even exists, it's accidental. Our goal with this webinar is for you to make your profit intentional. So let's build a budget for your practice with our goal of having an intentional profit. A P&L statement for your practice has three major categories, revenue, expenses, and if we subtract expenses from the revenue, we're left with net profit. Let's put a little more detail to this so we can be more specific in how we're going to use this tool to help manage our practices. Let's start building this by identifying an intentional amount of profit that we want to have. In the slide that you're looking at on the screen, we're choosing to have an optometric net of 35%. Now, we need to define what optometric net means. To calculate your optometric net, you need to add together your OD expense and your net profit. For some unknown reason, in optometry, we have calculated profit different from every other business in the world. Every other business in the world would simply look at net profit. I think this comes from the fact that historically, optometry was a one-doctor practice. 
And the doctors would look back at the practice at the end of the year to see how much money they made after they paid all their expenses. That combined number was really the sum of OD expense and net profit. So all of the optometric literature, literature that you've read says that the average optometric practice should have about a 30% net profit. What they're really saying is that 30% represents the OD expense plus the net profit. That's really confusing. So in this webinar, we're going to differentiate between net profit and optometric profit. This slide shows you the benchmark ratios necessary to hit your optometric net of 35%. Let's work our way down the slide to make sure that we understand each of these items. Let's start with revenue. This is revenue collected, not revenue billed. Revenue billed is an imaginary number that you will never see. Revenue collected is what you put into the bank. Revenue collected is what you pay your bills with. There are only four ways to increase your revenue collected. They are to increase your fees on things not covered by third parties, increase your per patient revenue, see your patients more frequently, and increase your number of new patients. If you do any one or all four of those, you will see an increase in your revenue collected. Now let's talk about expenses because we subtract our expenses from the revenue collected in order to have profit. The first expense you see up there is cost of goods. Anything that you buy from a laboratory and then sell to patients goes into this category your frames and lenses, your contact lenses. If you sell nutraceuticals, then all of that goes into this category. In fact, anything you buy from a lab and sell to a patient goes into this category. This category represents your cost, not the price at which you sell those materials. The next category is staff. This category contains everything that it costs you to have your staff. It includes wages, bonuses, benefits, and if you give gifts to your staff, then that goes into this category as well. Doctors do not go into the staff category because the next category is OD expense. This category contains everything that it costs you to have the doctors who work in your practices. And just like the staff category, this includes wages, bonuses, benefits, and anything else that it costs you to have the doctors in your practice. And by doctors, we mean both associate doctors and owner doctors. Now, for the owner doctors, do not include any dividends that the doctors receive from owning the practice in this category. Now, the next expense you see on the screen is occupancy. This category includes everything that it costs you to occupy your space, your rent, your triple net lease, everything that it costs you to occupy your space. The next category is other expenses. This is a very broad category that you should de detail out to know exactly what's happening within this category. It would include things like marketing, equipment expenses, and everything else from toilet paper to toner for the copy machine, the pharmaceutical agents that you keep in the exam room to use with patients. Most of the subcategories are gonna total less than 2% of the total revenue collected in the practice, but when you add them all together, they should be less than 10% of the total revenue collected by the practice. Now, if we add all the expenses together and subtract them from the revenue collected, then we have net profit. In our example above, the net profit is 15% of revenue collected. But you might say, I've read in our optometric literature that the profit in a practice should be 30%. 
Well, if we add together the net profit and the OD expense, that's 15% plus 20%, and that's going to equal 35%. Remember, we call that our optometric net. Now, let's drill down a little deeper to show you how to manage these numbers more effectively. The pie chart on the left shows you how the average practice takes in its revenue collected. 39% of the revenue collected comes from professional fees, and 61% of the revenue comes from product sales. Then there's 2% that comes from miscellaneous other things that the practice might sell. Now, you should know this breakdown for your practice because each of these items is a revenue stream for your practice. If you want to increase the revenue collected for your practice, then you should have a written plan to increase, increase each of the revenue streams for your practice. Look at the pie chart on the right. In the average practice, about 70% of the revenue collected comes from some sort of third party. Some practices, this number could be as high as 95%. In a practice that takes no third-party payments, this number would be as low as 0%. But in the average practice, the pie chart on the right represents how the third-party payments are coming into the practice. You should know this breakdown for your practice if you're going to manage revenue properly. Now let's start and work down our expenses. Let's talk about how to manage cost of goods. Here are four suggestions, five actually, to manage your cost of goods. Both the patient and the practice receive more income because the practice is a VSP premier practice than a practice is not. I look at this as a right pocket, left pocket issue. The VSP does not raise my fees that I receive from examining the patient. However, VSP lowers my lab cost. The net of that means I receive a higher amount of money for seeing a patient. That's a net win. The second suggestion is to join an alliance or a buying group. You should never buy any materials for your practice unit one. That's the highest price for anything that you would purchase. By joining an alliance or a buying group, You'll receive a discount that should surpass your fees for joining the alliance or buying group. The mistake that many practices make is joining too many alliances or buying groups, therefore diluting their buying power. The third suggestion is to manage your frame board. This is one of the greatest weaknesses we see in practices across the country, yet this is one of the most important areas that must be addressed. Most of the major frame companies have professionals who help people manage their frame boards more effectively. Make sure that you reach out and ask for help. Fourth suggestion is to manage your contact lens inventory. You have to answer the question, is it better to stock contact lenses or to order contact lenses from an inventory from a distributor or to just send ordered contact lenses as the patients pay for their contact lenses. There's a cost for you to warehouse contact lenses in your own practice versus having the contact lenses drop ship directly to the patient. You need to work these numbers out for your own practice based on the volume of contact lenses that you sell every month. This chart comes from the key metrics data which came from the MBA program. These numbers have not changed much since they were first gathered. Notice that the median revenue received per pair of glasses sold is about $227. The 90th percentile of that number is $385. You should know what this number is for your practice. The numbers are sitting in your practice management software, so make sure that you pull this number out and look at it every month. This number tells you how effective your doctors and your opticians are at prescribing and helping patients to purchase high quality frames and lenses. 
If you really want to drill down and understand your practice, you should gather this number for each optician in your practice. What you'll find very quickly is that some opticians are excellent at helping patients, and other opticians are always trying to find ways for patients to spend the least amount of money possible in your practice. Key principle to teach your optical staff is that we are the patient's eye care professionals. We are not the patient's banker. We should always make decisions on what is best for the patient and not what is the cheapest route to go. This chart also comes from key metrics, and it's a good tool to use to determine if you have the ideal frame inventory in your practice. Notice on this chart, based on the practice annual gross revenue, it gives you insufficient inventory, excessive inventory, and the ideal frame inventory. Based on your practice's annual gross revenue, what's the number of frames that you have in your inventory? This chart also shows the median annual frames inventory turnover. I really don't find that number to be helpful. Instead, I prefer to look at each frame line and the turnover for each frame line. Your frame line turnover should be a minimum of three times. And I emphasize minimum of three times. So if you have 30 frames in a frame line, then you should sell 90 of those frames per year. Remember, that's your minimum. So if you're selling less than three times turnover, then you should replace that frame line with one that's going to be more effective. Let's move to managing staff expenses. One of the biggest mistakes I see in practices is that staff defines their work by what they do rather than what they produce. It's extremely important that each staff member understands clearly what they produce for the practice and how that number is measured and that that staff member is held accountable for that production. An easy example to use is the end product of the person doing recall. That end product is a patient in the chair. It's not a scheduled exam. It's not a patient that's been contacted to return to the office, but it's a patient actually presenting in the office for an examination. We can count them. That is a valuable product. And that's what you're actually paying the recall person to produce. We have to manage over time. And overtime is something that happens a lot in practices. An hourly wage employee who's riding the clock to get overtime is being paid time and a half. It's the office manager's responsibility to make sure the staff is getting their work done within the time frame that they are actually scheduled within the office. Now, you're always going to hear from staff that we need more staff. This is true for all practices. So let's think through the numbers to see if the practice can actually support more people. The bucket of money you have to buy all of your non-doctor staff is 22%. That's the top, not a penny more. Look at what you're actually paying staff currently and add it all together and see if it's 22% of revenue collected or less. If it's more than 22%, then the practice needs to increase its revenue collected in order to pay for your current staff. Whenever a staff member would come to me and say that we need more staff, my answer was always the same. I agree, we do need more staff. And the moment you can show me how adding a new staff member will add an additional $140,000 to the practice gross revenue collected, will hire that new staff member. So can a new staff member add additional income because they are an income producer? Think about an optician. If we hired another optician and that allowed us to see more patients and the number of that increased the gross revenue of the practice by $140,000, would we hire that new person? Absolutely we would. Or if this new staff member could take work off of a revenue generating staff member so that the net is an additional $140,000, would we hire that person? 
Absolutely we would. So rather than just adding another staff member, let's think through how to make the practice more productive by adding a new staff member that can add an additional $140,000 to the gross revenue of the practice. Many practices fall into the trap of salary creep. Salary creep is when you have a long-term employee that's getting a raise every year just because it's been another year and they eventually outpace the pay for their position. There are several websites that you can use to identify what you should be paying people for specific positions within your practice. One of them is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This reports the government view of the staff members who work in your practice. This data is generally two years old. So look at it with that eye in mind. There are two other websites I'm going to give you that are more current, and you can look at all three and make the determination of what's good for your practice. Salary.com and payscale.com. Each of these allow you to adjust for the region where your country is, the state where your country or where your practice is and allows you to drill down even to the local area, perhaps even the city where your practice is. So you can get pretty specific on these websites. Now here's a helpful graph from salary.com for optician. This graph is for the entire country. So you should narrow this down by your region, state, and even drill down into your city for an accurate benchmark for your practice. Here's the government's website. This is for OD compensation, but again, it's for the entire country, so you should narrow this also down for the area in where your practice is. And again, notice that this information is about two years old. So compare this information to more recent information so that you actually have a better understanding of what it should be. Now this is an example of the Bureau of Labor Statistics where it said the medium income for an optometrist for the country was $111,790. And you can see here that salary.com has that number at $125,428. Here are some key suggestions to help you manage the optometrist working in your practice. A median optometrist is going to generate $700,000 annually. An excellent or a high performing optometrist will generate a revenue of about $1.4 million. The median OD is still doing a lot of the exam themselves, whereas an excellent OD will be delegating the majority of the exam. The median OD will be practicing this year pretty much the way they practiced last year whereas the excellent OD is always improving, always trying to improve their mastery of their position. The median OD is only going to recommend or suggest or just offer to the patient where the excellent performing OD will prescribe for the patient. We know that when the doctor prescribes, the patient is more likely to get what the doctor prescribed rather than if the doctor only recommended, suggested, or offered. An excellent OD is going to prescribe the return to the practice for the patient. The script they use that's the best is based on your findings today, prescribing that you return in so many days, weeks, and months for the following problem. So what kind of doctors do you have in your practice? Are you managing them best performance. Now we know from the key metrics data that the median OD generates about $306 per complete exam. This number has gone up a dollar or down a dollar every year for the last 10 years and that stays pretty consistent. We also know that the median OD has a capture rate in the mid 60s. An excellent OD who prescribes for the patient has a higher capture rate. It is a far better use of the resources of your practice to increase your capture rate 
than to go out and try to find new patients. Let's talk about how to manage occupancy expenses. It's possible that your practice square footage is too small and therefore limiting your practice. It's also possible that your practice square footage is too large and therefore you're paying too much for rent and the space is not being utilized appropriately. This chart from the key metrics data can help you determine the square footage you should have in your practice based on your gross revenue collected. We also know that best practices have a minimum of 25% of the practice total square footage devoted to the optical. And now let's go to other expenses. We should say a word about this because it's so important. Most importantly, you need to put a person in charge of this area so there's both responsibility assigned and accountability required. You should create a budget and make sure the person in charge is following the budget. It's essential to calculate the return on investment for both marketing and equipment. I see practices all the time that dump money into marketing and purchase of equipment and have no idea if they're getting a return on their investment higher than the money they spent, either on the marketing or on the equipment. If you're going to invest dollars in something, you should expect to see a return on your investment. Now we talked about cost of goods and we talked about avoiding unit, ordering unit one, and that's going to apply to the other expenses category as well. So if you're not utilizing a purchase order system within your practice, you should consider adding one. This will help you control your expenses better. All right, what's our action plan? We've talked a lot of stuff. We want to have a report at least monthly on both the income and especially the expenses in the practice. We want to compare our spending to our projected budget for the year. So if we're four months into the year, then we want to compare the first four months of our spending to the first four months of our spending in our projected budget. We also want to take last year's annual P&L and compare it to this year's spending to see how we're doing. Almost every practice out there in the world has high months and low months based on many things. It's seasonal, it's kids going back to school, you happen to be a resort town, a lot of reasons. So you can't just say, I want to do a certain number every month. It needs to be a realistic number based on past performance, but projected to future performance. Now, if your numbers are out of control, then I want you to move to weekly or even daily reporting. So in control monthly, out of control, you move it to quicker time frames so that you're managing more effectively. So all of the things that we talked about today have probably triggered some thoughts in your mind. And you're starting to think about what are the top three actions that I should take to improve my practice. I want you to write those down. But most importantly, I want you to identify what is the number one action that will improve your practice and I want you to concentrate on that one. I'll talk to practices who say, hey, I made a list of 10 things I could do in my practice, and, and I could check off numbers 7, 8, and 9 pretty quickly here and reduce the 10 down to 7. And I'll tell them, you're not effectively using your time. The most important thing you can do is where you should be spending your time. I want you to know in my own life, my hardest decisions are not between good and evil. They're between what's good and what's best. What is the best use of my time 
should be the question that's always foremost in your mind. And that takes us to questions. So I'm going to turn it back over to our good friends at VSP and they'll take a look at some questions that you're submitting and we'll see if we can answer those for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. Before we start taking questions from the chat, I want to let attendees know to stick around to the end of the webinar to complete a quick survey to help us deliver content you want. If you haven't chatted in your questions yet, you can still do so. So uh, the first question I have for you, Dr. Wright, is what can I do to reduce costs while my office is closed? That's an excellent question because your uh, desire is to make sure that you have a positive cash flow in your practice. So go to Review of Optimized Business, and we have a series of articles there that are related to how to manage finances as you're moving through this time. But in general, what you should be doing is talking to your landlord and each of your vendors and trying to get them to give you 60, 90 days grace to allow those, this, this time that you're in right now to, to move as close to zero as possible. The issue of moving staff to either a, an unemployment or a furloughed position, uh, those are decisions that you're going to need to make, and you're making those decisions in the perspective of the SBA loans that are to be forgiven. So the PPP loan by the SBA allows you to take two and a half times one month of payroll and they give you that money for the eight week period that you've got to spend it all in. I'm going to tell you that if you stop and think about that for a minute, if I take one month of payroll times 2.5, that means two months of payroll, I'm going to actually take two of that 2.5 way and, and be paying for staff. That gives me 0.5 to pay on other things, and the SBA has a list of approved expenses that you can use. If you use that money for anything other than those expenses, two bad things happen. One is that you have to pay that money back, and the second bad thing that can happen is there's the hint that they can come after you for fraud. So don't play with this money. You document exactly how you spend this money, you keep checks, you, you keep uh, credit card accounts, you, you know exactly how the money was spent so you can document it back. That's extremely important. But that gives you a little cash flow into the practice in order to manage the practice through this time. Now, some of you are going to run into a problem where some staff members are not going to come back. So the key to this game is you have to have the same number of FTEs full-time equivalent employees during the time you're paying this eight weeks of payroll money out as you did before. So if you have staff members who are not coming back, they want to stay on un unemployment for whatever reason, then think about what you have to do. You're going to take your part-time people and move them to full-time. You're going to hire family members. You're going to, you're going to do everything you can do to get your FTEs the same as they were before, so that you can keep the money. And that's going to help you. Thank you. Question. Our, our next question. Hi, I'm a new owner to private practice. I believe most people charge two to three times the frame cost. What is the average retail sales price for lenses and contact lenses cost? Is it also two to three times the wholesale cost? That's a great question, and, and the answer is yes. Most people charge three times markup for the average frame. When you get into really high expensive frames or even into the luxury frame, you may be down to one and a half to two times. But for the majority of frames you're gonna have on your, on your frame board, you should be charging at least three times. And I'm gonna tell you that every time you put a frame on your frame board, it costs you $15. You got to think about, I have got to pay a staff member to order that frame, unbox that frame, clean that frame, 
put it on the frame board, at least once a week come back and dust that frame, take it off the frame board, adjust it, put it on a patient's face. And if you add up how much that costs you, it costs you $15 on average for every frame on your frame board. So I would suggest that the best price to charge for the majority of your frames on the frame board would be around three times plus $15. And that gets you a return on your frames that's effective. Now there are other ways to look at your frame board and that is look at buying buyouts and end runs. You can pick up frames that still have a warranty for 10 cents on the dollar and yet still pay or charge for them the same as you would if you bought that same frame at, at high price. So, so a little bit of management of your frame board can make a huge difference. And all of your frame vendors that are putting frames on your frame board have people who are thinking about how to do this in the best way. So talk to them. Ask them. You know what's going on in my region. Help me understand what I should be doing on my frame board that I'm not doing. How can I improve the performance of my frame board? That should be a question that's the first one you ask every time you see a frame board. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I don't think I'm using my office manager properly. How much of the recommendations you are making should be done by the office manager versus owner doctor? So I'm going to really hit you between the eyes with this one because most doctors in most practices I've looked at are not using the office manager effectively. In essence, most practices have simply taken a staff member who's been there generally the longest and given them a title, but no responsibility and no accountability. If you're going to have an office manager, you want somebody who's more than just a buffer between the staff and the doctor. You want somebody who's effectively managing the practice. So that means that they have to have management skill sets. Do they know how to do X, Y management theory? Do they understand how to manage people based on personality? And if you tell me the answer is no, they're just the person who was here the longest and I gave them that title, then you really don't have an office manager. You just have a buffer between the staff and the doctor. I'm going to tell you, once you move to have an office manager and you give them time to manage and you say, look, your job is to help me have a fiscally healthy practice. If you really want to understand it from a business standpoint, the owner of the practice is the CEO, the chief executive officer of the practice, and the office manager should be the COO, the chief operating officer of the practice. And so if you simply Google those two terms and understand the difference between those two positions, it will begin to show you that an office manager should be the one in charge of pretty much everything that we talked about today. Thank Next you. Um, we've, re we've received a follow-up question uh, about the frame cost. And it's for contact lenses and frame lenses. Name the frame source for discount frames with warranty again, please. Oh, excellent. I didn't give you one before, so I'll give it to you now. Um, every frame rep that comes into your office, you want to talk to them and understand what their long-term job is. And the moment they say, because this happens a lot within the, within the industry, you'll have a frame vendor who says, you know, I'm switching from uh, selling frames to contact lenses or I'm going into the uh, pharmaceutical industry. The moment they tell me that, I just look them in the eye and say, I'll buy every frame in your bag today for 10 cents on the dollar. And most of the time, they're willing to make that trade. If you read our trade magazines, you're gonna find out that laboratories often lose the license to sell certain frames. And when I see that a laboratory has lost the ability to, to sell a certain frame line, just pick one to talk about. Let's just say Calvin Klein. 
I'm going to be the first one who calls the, uh, the manager of that laboratory, and I'm going to say, look, I want to buy every one of your Calvin Klein frames that you have at 10 cents on the dollar so that it cleans that inventory out for you, but it also helps me so that I can sell those frames. They're still good frames. They're still current frames. But you have to have some strategy. It's going to take a little bit of work. You've got to, you've got to do your job and do your due diligence of understanding what's going on in the industry in your area. But with a little bit of work, it can have a nice financial return for you in the practice. Thank you. Uh, we have another follow-up question. What is the recommended markup for contact lenses? That's a great question. Because it took us 20 years to figure that one out. I remember the um, uh, way that people just felt the world was ending when contact lenses began to be sold in drugstores and through avenues other than the doctor's office. And for 20 years, doctors tried to figure out how to do this. And what we finally ended up with is price of the contact lenses, as long as they're within 7% of what's being sold on the internet, the patient will still come to you and buy from you. Now, what do you do? How do you make up the revenue that we used to make from contact lenses? You shift it over to your professional fees so that you don't lose money. Now, if you're a professional contact lens fitter and you believe that your skill set is better than the average person out there, then charge appropriately for what you're doing. And so that's the solution to contact lenses. Thank you. And it sounds like that would also answer this question, but I want to see if you have any other color to add. This question is, how can you remain competitive with 1-800 contacts for your practice? It's two to three times the wholesale cost. So make your contact lenses within 7% of what they're selling contact lenses for. And therefore, the patient is going to sit in your office. They're going to look at that number and the other numbers, because you know they're price shopping you on their phone while they're sitting in your office. So you've got to be competitive on the fee, but you shift the difference over to your professional fee. Um, regarding PPP and the eight-week period, I have three staff. Two will keep coming into the office working on AR and other tasks. The third will not return. To qualify for forgiveness, I need to pay all three salaries. Doesn't seem fair, the one that won't work gets paid when the others are working. Would you furlough that employee and replace them with, say, a family member to keep up the FTE? At what point would you recommend an optometrist to hire a tech whose sole purpose is to improve chair time? So for that staff member who does not want to come back, that reduces your FTEs by one, assuming they're full-time. So you've got to replace that person with someone else for that eight-week period to make sure that your FTEs are matching. So you can hire a family member. You can take a part-time person who's worked for you in the past and put them to full-time. But the game that you have to play is to get that FTE number to match. If you don't, then they're going to reduce the amount of money that you get forgiven by the percentage of the reduction in FTE. Thank you. Um, and it looks like we I have one more question. How would you calculate ROI for marketing and what marketing outlets have you seen the best ROI from? Oh, that's a great question. Because marketing is so misunderstood. If you actually talk to marketing people, they'll tell you that half of all marketing dollars are effective and the other half are not effective. The only problem is we don't know which half 
each dollar goes into. So I look at that and go, I'm sorry, I'm not playing that game. I'm going to set aside a certain amount of money to run a marketing campaign. Let's say that I want to run a, a marketing campaign where I uh, target a certain group of people and I want them to come in for um, a certain activity. I'll give you a specific so you can, you can put your mind around it. Um, if you have a, an optical that, that has a boutique look to it and you've got a restaurant in your area after we get through the pandemic and they're open back up again and let's say it's a boutique type restaurant, I'm going to walk into the office manager of that restaurant and I'm going to say, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to hire, well, not hire is the wrong word. I'd, I'd like to put new glasses on every single one of your wait staff and they'll be cool glasses and they'll be high end glasses. But all I'm asking in return is that one of the clients who come into your restaurant and say to your wait staff, hey, that's a really cool pair of glasses, that they simply say, I got those from Dr. Wright. He's a great doctor. They reach in their pocket, they pull out a business card of mine and hand it to that customer. You ought to go there too. Now, I can calculate how much money I'm going to spend buying glasses for those people. I can calculate every person who comes into my practice from that experience and how much they spend, and what my net profit is, and if I'm not getting a five times return on my money, then I'm going to do a different project next time. So you can calculate every single marketing activity you do, how much money you put into it, and how much money and profit came out of it. The idea I want you to think about is, is, is there many ways to track things? So, for example, if you're running something on a, on a website or as an email blast, you can put an imaginary staff member's name in there. You know, whatever your marketing campaign is, and when you call the office, be sure to ask for Joe because Joe has a special present for you. Now, there's no one on staff named Joe, but we know that every single person who asks for Joe is somebody who came from that specific marketing campaign. You can also do this by contacting the phone company and getting a special phone line for a marketing campaign you're running. So you know that every person who calls on that special phone line is re actually responding to that marketing campaign. So you can track them internally in your practice. So there are lots of ways you can track people but the whole idea here is I spent a certain amount of money on the marketing campaign. How much am I getting back? And every year we look at all the marketing campaigns that are run and we say the ones that were effective, we're going to run those again next year. And the ones that weren't effective, we're going to take that money away from those campaigns and either put them in new campaigns or make the effective campaigns stronger key is to make sure that you're managing your marketing by return on investment. Thank you. It looks like we have a couple more questions. Um, let's see. What is the suggested market price for lenses, such as progressive lenses or single vision lenses for spectacles? So in the MBA data, that was the best survey that was done across uh, the country. The percentages are listed in one of the graphs inside, uh, and the average for progressive was 2.6. Thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations on obtaining the data you're suggesting we obtain, such as Edge Pro or Analyze? RPM doesn't provide easy to obtain or read reports. Yeah, you have to have a business dashboard, which is what those programs are, for really drilling down into your numbers and understanding them. So there, there are several different versions of programs out there, and, and I would suggest that, that, and I've talked to enough practices, some of them like one of the programs, others like the other uh, programs. So, so I have no um, 
dog in this hunt. I'm, I'm happy if you have any one of them. But the key to it is you have to look at it and use them. So many of the doctors I talk to have the programs, but they don't look at the data. So if I ask them, which one of your opticians has the highest per dollar sales for glasses? Most people can't tell me. Yet all of the business dashboard programs can tell you immediately who's the best. And if you know who the best is, and you know who the worst is in your practice, how about we take the best practices and teach them to the worst performing staff member in the practice? Here's the simple game we're gonna play. I want you to say exactly the same words in exactly the same order to every patient you see for the next three months. And we're gonna look at your numbers and see if they actually approach the skill set of the best optician in the practice. And if they're doing the same thing in the same way, their numbers should increase. And if their numbers increase, now we've raised the performance of the practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. This concludes our questions at this time and starts our, our survey poll. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright, for a wonderful presentation. Attendees, please complete the survey before leaving the WebEx so we can deliver content you want. If you're looking for more webinars like this one, go to learnacademy360.com and register for one of our upcoming webinars. Next week, we'll hear again from Dr. Wright on what to do during your downtime. And HR expert Shauna Harrington, in tough times, be your best self. To attend these webinars or visit our content library in e-learning, go to learnacademy360.com. Thank you.